For the last 300 years, we have gradually intensified what might be termed our scientific program. With the rise of humanism in the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe, human attention focused almost directly upon the material advancement of society. There is good reason why this should have happened. For a long time, the average, even so-called cultured person, had given practically no consideration to the pressing problems of social change. There was no consistent recognition of the rights of man, his rights of decent living, his rights of education, religious freedom, his rights to improve his techniques and skills, broaden his knowledge and understanding. By degrees, however, this emphasis, well justified at the time, became excessive. Slowly the universe of values disappeared, and in its place came the universe of utilities. Progress came to be measured entirely in the physical advancements in the arts and sciences. It was inevitable that this unbalanced condition should ultimately lead to some kind of a crisis. Wherever we develop a lopsided and unbalanced and unreasonable perspective, we must pay for it. And in the 19th century, we made the dramatic shift from a religious cultural to an economic industrial basis. Then the era of invention became dominant, and one discovery after another increased our conveniences and also complicated our problems. So today we have the atomic bomb, which might be regarded as the inevitable end of an attitude. It might have been delayed a little longer, but man being what he is, with the pressures and intensities peculiar to his kind, living under a psychological situation such as now prevails was moved by forces beyond his control, step by step, relentlessly, uh, to the present state of affairs. The only way we can understand it is to recognize that it demonstrates the immutable processes of cause and effect. We have sold the whirlwind, now we must reap the whirlwind. Had we been more careful, more thoughtful, we would have had a better state of affairs. But being creatures of extremes, of intensities, of great pressures, uh, we never have been able to advance any program with dignity and moderation. The spiritual situation therefore comes home to each and every one of us. Probably this is what nature has intended. Man has always learned the hard way, and he seldom accepts facts until they slap him in the face, or bring to bear upon him some condition which halts him in consternation. The Gradual decline 
of religious intensity has lowered our ethical levels, has weakened our internal resistance uh, to stress, and has left us, much like Cardinal Wolsey, naked to our enemies. These enemies, in this case, being our own intellectual productions. But we must learn with what we have. The knowledge is not going to be taken away. It may be possible that we might have a bad setback in the development of an atomic program. But we cannot, again, forget the strange, dangerous instrument we have devised. So now we must learn to live with it. We must also recognize that its danger lies not in itself, but in ourselves. The atomic bomb is comparatively harmless unless man, through his own psychic tensions, releases it upon himself and upon society. So the bomb is not the danger. The man is the danger. The individual who has not yet matured his own consciousness, has not yet reached a state of self-discipline, has been handed this terrible instrument. And we are hoping against hope that he will not use it. Religion has to meet this problem in two ways. First, it has to build as rapidly as possible within man the kind of spiritual integrity which will prevent him from the destructive use of atomic power. This means that from the standpoint of the religious life of mankind, there has to be a, an immediate and rapid shift from religion as a theory, as a policy, as a sectarianism, to religion as a dynamic experience within our own lives. To live at all, man must live by a better religious code. This is difficult, and uh, perhaps this difficulty can be summarized in the fact that I received in the mail two or three days ago quite an elaborate brochure which should have been and could have been written about 1850. It's a 410 years behind its time. It is the type of thing that we might have expected a fervent missionary uh, to write in a desperate effort to protect his own creed, not only from assault by other Christians, but particularly by, uh, from the assault of non-Christian worshippers. In this time, the brochure is most untimely. It again attempts to emphasize the inevitable rights of one Christian sect, not only to differ from all other religions of the world, but to declare without hesitation that all these others are wrong. Not only wrong, but so very wrong that it becomes the duty of the true believer to remain completely intolerant of them, or become that way for the good of his own immortal soul. Now this is very unfortunate, because if the world today has one defense against the chaos of materialism, it is the vast body of religious peoples everywhere in the world. Materialism is a two-pronged adversary. First, it is represented by materialistic political structures, 
and we think in terms of world communism. It is also represented by materialistic intellectual levels. And in this group, we have a great many educators, scientists, and persons in our own communities who have developed this intense materialism. Against these dangers, and they are real dangers, we have only the goodwill of people of strong faith. Now, it makes very little difference at the moment which one of the five great religions of the world uh, these people belong to. Because they believe in God, because they believe in the brotherhood of man, because they believe in peace rather than war, because they believe that there is a spiritual destiny uh, which man must face, spiritual laws which he must obey, a spiritual power at the source of life, because they have these beliefs, they are our friends, and our very necessary friends at this time. Yet in a day when the survival of all faiths is hazarded, we have denominations picking at each other. Not only picking at each other in a rather nasty, nice way, but actually pointing out to the devout members of their own groups that it is a mortal sin to unite with these other people. Now this is just about as dangerous to us as the bomb because it is destroying the instrument with which we must attempt to hold the world together. The world is not only in danger of falling apart because of atomic fission, it is in danger of falling apart because there seems to be no real desire to keep it together. If our civilization goes, it will not go because of the bomb. It will go because man has cultivated and protected for hundreds of years attitudes which had in them the very substance of disintegration. So we are concerned now in thinking through how we are going to meet on a spiritual level the challenge of this tremendous scientific discovery. We know politically and socially that we must be one world or perish. We now also begin to suspect that we must be one religion or have none, and that the weakness in our own spiritual unity is almost certainly going to leave us the victim of the animosities and prejudices ill feelings, resentments of persons whom we have hurt spiritually as well as materially. So we have to, to think very much along these lines. We are faced by one enemy, essentially, the enemy of scientific skill. This adversary is highly organized also has its dedications to progress, to the advancement of knowledge, is served by persons with a strange devotion uh, to the ideas of science, and held in a kind of hypnotic trance by the fantasy of the scientific approach to life. These people, however, are well integrated as a group. They are, no, they are going on their way. They know what they are doing. Day by day they are expanding their knowledge and their skills. Not all in a destructive direction, but too much of it in that direction. Against this highly organized program rises the voice 
of popular indignation, a strong dissent, but a dissent of peoples that have never actually formed one structure, but have spoken as individuals without even a general sense of common sympathy. They are not a solid pattern of conviction. They are merely fragments of fear rising up in all parts of the world and asking some kind of peace in this time of trouble. This situation will not fit the times. And I think we are, as never before, in our spiritual emergency, faced with something that has always been one of our greatest difficulties. And that is that we have outgrown the sectarian concept of religion. We are in a condition now where we must begin to think in terms of one world religion. This does not mean that we must demand religious conformities, but we must divide between religious essentials and religious non-essentials. We must recognize the importance of a common unity on those levels in which our survival is involved. Perhaps what we need is something not patterned unlike the great political movements that are attempting world peace or attempting to maintain an uneasy armistice at this time. Just as it is necessary for the nations of the world to sit down together and try by every possible means to arbitrate their differences, so it is necessary for the religions of the world with far greater justification than policy can ever have to sit down together and recognize the spiritual emergency that is affecting the entire world, and that unless religion unites in this emergency, it will not only fail to contribute to the common good, but may very well destroy itself utterly. It is no longer a matter in which we have the luxury of our prejudices. It is now a matter of unite for survival, not only for the survival of religious conviction, but for the survival of man under a way of life that can give him spiritual security, without which he cannot function. Man is a religious creature, and if he does not have the strength of his religion, his entire ethical structure uh, loses tone, loses value. Now we know these problems exist. We would like to do something about them. But most persons today are a little hesitant in daring to hope that anything on a world level will actually be done. If the conditions arising today and which certainly will become more and more intense in the next year or two. If these conditions do not point the way to what is necessary, we can have very little hope that the human being is capable of spiritual brotherhood. We must continue to assume that his religion is on his lips but not in his life. This does not mean that everyone is lacking in these qualities, but that the great formal structures upon which religious motion depends either lack the courage or the insight to sacrifice their own peculiar uh, prejudices for the preservation of the essential principle of religion. It looks as though we were again going to be confronted 
with the problem of working out our own salvation. The individual, recognizing his own needs, must build his own religion, perhaps deriving it from the faiths familiar to him, perhaps not actually departing from the broad structure of prevailing religious teaching, but making certain powerful applications within his life and achieving in himself uh, the tolerance which the world does not seem to be able to attain. So we may feel at the moment that as the crisis spreads, as the problem deepens, that the average person must begin to consider his own place in this world emergency. We read various accounts of what might happen and the tremendous potential destruction that could follow the use of atomic missiles. We also realize that the Holocaust proclaimed in these reports will have a tremendous effect upon our moral structure. Even the fear of it has already proved most disintegrating. But as the emergencies come closer, if they do, and we hope they do not, there must be ever more strength within the person to keep his own vision clear in the presence of situations over which he cannot personally exercise any general control. Here we have the second prong of our religious problem, and that is that among the great works of religion, perhaps the greatest, is to carry man through adversity. This is the final test of religion. For most people, religious integrity is measured by the ability of the, of the believer to retain his own inner center of integration under the stress of circumstances. Thus, the religions we know must either be used to prevent trouble or to carry us in time of trouble. And both of these uses are valid. I think we must also um, generally realize that the atomic bomb, while it changes the pattern of our society, does not essentially change its hazards. Life becomes a little more dangerous, but this danger has always existed in some degree, to some measure. The life of the individual has always been in danger. Therefore, this is not the major consideration. The major consideration is that we have now the opportunity for a long and careful period of waiting in which our nervous systems become exhausted with anticipatory dreads. Instead of being able to rise to an emergency, we must face a long psychological depression of attitude and of resource. These things are harder to bear than the actual danger itself. Thus we need to integrate as far as we can our spiritual integration or in our spiritual consciousness in this emergency. How are we going to go about it? What will be the problem of religion for us? perhaps for the next several hundred years as we move more and more 
into this situation in which our skill can hazard every value which we possess? I think the, uh, the simple answer for all these things is a series of deeply held, firmly believed acceptances. Man saves most of his energies by acceptance. By acceptance we do not mean compromise. This is not the point at all. But we must face most of the problems that we cannot solve with the thought that is expressed in the Bible. Suffer it to be so now. This too shall pass away. Therefore, what arises, uh, what rises over the horizon of our experience must have a measure of acceptance. Today, we live in a world in which we will either spend most of our time worried, being afraid, wandering, doubting, criticizing, or condemning, or else we must develop a consciousness of acceptance. Now every negative attitude that we hold, every fear, doubt, and anxiety that we nourish is essentially bad for us. It is the same concept as that expressed in the Shakespearean play. The brave men die but once, and cowards die many deaths. The individual with an acceptance simply faces the fact. He brings to bear upon that fact all that he knows and all that he is but he declines to dramatize it. He takes out of his entire concept of life the emotional superlatives with which he exhausts his own energies. Instead of saying that a thing is good or a thing is bad, the average person takes the attitude that it is awful, awful, awful good, or awful, awful, awful bad. Now all these awfuls are a loss of time, a loss of energy, and a method of indoctrinating ourselves with a negative hypnotic technique. Now, I know that many people are so emotionally constructed that something has to be awful, awful, awful all the time, or they do not know how to live. But we're reaching the point where the world around us is producing so many intense situations that we can no longer afford to react to them with continually mounting tension, or we will disintegrate ourselves before the bomb has a chance. To meet this particular situation, we have to, to call upon some of the insight that has sustained others who have been good and wise and right down through the history of human endeavor. It has long been held that actually the human being is a kind of visitor in this world. Man is in this world, but not of it, by his very nature and constitution. His body extends into the sphere of matter, but his heart and his mind and his soul ascend into the mysterious worlds of creativity and idealism and spiritual values. Thus, while man lives here, his life can never be complete in the terms of the things that exist here. It makes not much difference how long he lives. For some it is not long enough, and for others it is too long. 
and for very few is it ever just right. Whatever we achieve, we must lay down the instruments of achievement in due time and pass them on to other generations. We are really almost strangers in the planet which we inhabit. We come for a time and we depart again. Materialists take, a, take the attitude that this is all of us. Well, if this is all of us, then there is very little of moment uh, that uh, merits much consideration. But to the religious person, this is not all of us. There is, in addition to this mortal existence, a life within us, a life which is the source of our strength, the source of our hope, and the very substance of our faith. If this life is real, if this inner self has an actual existence, this is the part that is important. These other things are comparatively unimportant. To hope in terms of important things is far better than to fear in terms of unimportant things. So if we are spiritually oriented in this life, we are capable of a series of acceptances. For underneath the surface of our various belligerencies, we are creatures of continual acceptance. We may rebel, but we must finally accept the dictates of nature and the laws of heaven. We have no choice. Unfortunately, however, we are never sure the full measure of this problem of acceptance. We may find that the things we fear never do come about. All the more reason why we cannot wreck and destroy our own lives with unreasonable fears. If we can smooth down and simplify the attitudes of our own consciousness, we will, be on a long, we will be a long way ahead in the preservation of our essential religious convictions. Let's try to think of it this way, then. Let us say that if we want to belong to the religion of the atomic age, that we will realize the immediacy of everything we believe and everything that we think. Under this process, in which our time allotments become uncertain, now is the time for the attainment of all that is good. Now is the time of the practice of all that is virtuous. Now is the time for the kindness which we can no longer afford uh, to delay. Therefore, in our religious life now is always the moment for the practice of our faith. Now is the proper instant for the kind word, the good thought, and the helpful deed. Now is the time to share strength with those who need. Now is the time to know our children, to take a deeper interest in our friends. Now is the time to read the good book. Now is the time uh, to develop the latent talents. Now is the time to do anything that needs to be done. We used to say, when we retire, we will begin to think. Now is the time when we must begin to think. We used to say, tomorrow I will phone my neighbor and wish her well. 
Now is the time to make that call. Uh, things must move from the concept of infinite procrastination to immediate action. We can live a very long time in a short time if we live fully. The average person in the next six weeks could do most of the good deeds that he will ordinarily get around to in the next 25 years because he will space them out. This year he will make some little improvement in something. Next year he will mow the lawn. But in the next six weeks, we can pile together more value by real intent of purpose than we might ever have gotten around to among the continuing distractions of our careers. Therefore, religion, philosophy, art, music, culture, these things suddenly become things of now rather than things of sometime. Thoughtfulness is now. Sincerity is now. Honor is now. We are not going to live a little better when we get a little richer. The time to live better must be now. If we can move, therefore, from this long pattern of things to this immediate recognition of urgency, we can achieve that which is the purpose of our lives. Nature is not really particularly interested in how long we live. Nature may beam a kindly smile upon the centenarian, but it also afflicts him with numerous ills. The purpose of life is growth. Up to very recently, the whole concept of growth has gotten lost. In its place has come the idea that life is an adventure in the fulfillment of ambitions. Life is a kind of race in which the important thing is to reach the end as quickly as possible. We don't realize it, but that is the way we live. Instead of that, we have the, the possibility of experiencing all of the values of life in a comparatively short time. In this way, life is not shortened, because life really has nothing to do with counting birthdays. Life is actually the record of significant events which have enriched character. If in the normal occurrence of life, as we see it, the average person has a dozen of these significant events scattered over 70 or 80 years, and the rest of the time has been largely devoted to selfishness, thoughtlessness, and indifference, actually life to this person consists of 12 events. The rest is meaningless. Now these events could have been brought much more closely together had the a realization of the importance of getting into life all the growth that we can. From a religious and spiritual standpoint, there's been considerable discussion, for example, about war. And the young men who went out, and in a very short time perhaps, lost their lives in the service of their country. We wonder whether or not their lives were really shortened, or whether the wasted time was simply squeezed out of them, and the significant things were all that was left. And one who came back after coming very near to death held this concept very close to himself. He said, in a few weeks, I lived a complete lifetime. 
and nothing that can happen over a long span of years can possibly equal what happened in a few weeks. So under our new concept of things, we can have this immediacy of achievement. Now this is of twofold advantage. First, we have no way of knowing that this bomb was ever going to drop. Maybe the world will be wise enough not to let it. But if we do begin to build immediate accomplishment into consciousness, consider how much more we will have in rural growth if we follow this pattern through a period of a normal lifetime. Supposing that the process of becoming better is recognized as so real and urgent that we begin the immediate practice of the principles that we hold to be true. And then we have a nice long life. Think how much we can get done. We can, might almost take the attitude that we can live the next five lives now and uh, perhaps get a two weeks vacation somewhere along the line. We can outgrow our own weaknesses so much more rapidly if we take this attitude of immediacy. But if in two, five, ten years, bombs do fall, we don't know, we shall then know that regardless of what has happened, we have lived well. We have lived a full life. We have accomplished the purpose we came here to accomplish, and that was to grow. Beyond this, we need have no fear. For if anything survives, it is this accomplishment. And if we have kept faith with realities, realities will certainly keep faith with us. Under these situations, then, we have these two approaches uh, to a spiritual code for this confused age. The first of these is acceptance, and the other is immediacy. Let's consider this problem of acceptance in the terms of Zen, or in some one of the great mystical systems of the world. If you have known very many people in this world, you have realized that individuals consistently destroy their own lives. They destroy them by building deep negative patterns that nearly everyone has certain belligerencies in himself, resentments. These can become as habitual as alcohol or narcotics. And by degrees we learn to resent everything. We no longer have any sense of value. We whip ourselves and then blame the universe. We destroy our own health and then blame our relatives. Step by step, we defeat our own characters, becoming in the end whiners, complainers, and open rebels, shaking our fists at heaven as though heaven would deign to notice. This kind of rejection, the rejection of the simple facts of things, will become a serious psychotic problem if we do not control it. Now many people do not really go off the deep end in this. It just becomes a nagging factor all the way along through life. Something that takes out of life its richness, makes life poor and sloppy and comparatively meaningless. Thus, we defeat the experience of God in ourselves. For the whiner, the nagger, the fusser, and the fumer can never really 
experience the presence of God in consciousness. The acceptor accepts God with life. He thinks he is accepting a tragedy, but in that tragedy appears the luminous form of divinity. Acceptance is always the short way, the simple path, that leads to understanding. As we have said, acceptance is not condoning. It is facing that which is necessary. If we have problems to decide, we use every means at our disposal that can be considered thoughtful, reasonable, and intelligent. We make use of every faculty we possess to bring reason and logic and common sense to bear. When we have done these things, we rest the case. We're ready to take whatever happens because there is nothing more we can do about it. When we know there is nothing more that we can do, we generally relax. And the moment we are relaxed, the problem itself may evaporate, because problems are pressed into existence by tension alone. If the pressure of ourselves, of our own attitudes, if the exaggerations which we definitely contribute to a problem are removed, sometimes the problem becomes so insignificant that it appears ridiculous. But a little problem with a great deal of libido behind it can really become a nuisance. And most people have taken small things and fretted them into crises of one proportion or another. Zen, therefore, takes a very simple attitude on all of these problems. Just simply sit down quietly and realize your own identity with space, your own identity with the clear light of heaven, your own identity with the warm softness of the earth, that you are actually a being, that in yourself <coughs> you are complete to yourself. <coughs> Everything that you are uh, contributes to your completeness. Everything that you think creates its own worlds. You live in a quietude that is disturbed only by yourself. And you might as well get around and realize that. <coughs> if there's a lot of noise somewhere, you are making it, although it appears to be coming from elsewhere. If there are a lot of problems, you are making them. If there is confusion, this confusion is arising in yourself and not in facts. You live in a world of facts. You live in a world where black is black and white is white, or at least these are the names we have given these things. But most people are not happy about it. They want all the white things to be black and all the black things to be white. And if this change is not miraculously achieved, they decide to settle down and suffer for the rest of their lives. Some individuals insist that their own way is the right way, and that if nature will not adjust to them, they will declare war on nature. Well, this just worries nature to death. <laughs> And instead of a great fight, we have another Don Quixote de la Mancha going out lancing windmills. And many people lance windmills all their lives. Actually, the facts of existence are acceptable to the consciousness of man. Man can live with facts. Man can live with them, work with them, and die with them, and come in the end to a pretty good adjustment with all of these facts. But when he begins to deceive himself, he cannot live with anything. 
when he begins to demand, he is lost. So everything that we face is either a fact or it is nothing. A fact we can always adapt to. But nothing can take on a thousand mysterious, fantastic forms which still have no substance in any of them. So the great problems of life are the ones which are non-factual, problems which we invent, problems which we go out of our way to, su to sustain, problems for which we will sacrifice years of thought. And when we are through, we have achieved nothing. For we have been chasing a will of the wisp, but never did have any substance in it. So acceptance cuts down wear and tear and enables us to cope without emotionalization. Wars are very largely emotionalization. So is crime. The strange, crooked codes of deceivers have nothing in common with fact. But men have accepted them and struggled with them and suffered with them and died for them. And when it was all done, nothing was accomplished. But when we give our life to an error, we wasted that life. Nature has tried to tell us this for a long time, but no one was listening. In this atomic, in this atomic age, we have now to become factual. Factual does not mean cold. It does not mean matter of fact, as we use the term. It does not mean the loss of the warmth and the color of life. It simply means the loss of distortion. The loss of these grimacing ghosts and demons with which we have populated the world in which we live. Facts have the true warmth of a great reality. A great Japanese artist many years ago said that he was convinced that the greatest thing in all the world was the fact in art, and he defined this fact, as he said, the utter humility of art. Humility is its fact. Uh, great art is always humble. Great art and great lives are humble. And humbleness is factual. Humbleness is the common clay molded into the simple cup from which a man drinks. Fifteen hundred years ago, a Korean potter, probably a farmer, certainly a person of no estate, evidently got thirsty. And when you get thirsty, what do you do about it? You get a drink. This is very simple, but it is the highest form of reason. And because evidently he wanted a cup to drink with, he made one. Now the cup he made was just as crude as he could make it, because it was for one purpose only, to provide him with a drink. He didn't try to make it a cup. But because he didn't even try, something happened to the cup. It suddenly became a product of internal motion. He simply did it without knowing what he was doing or caring. But because he was himself, he pushed it in a little on this side, and touched it down a little on that side in the clay, uh, to make it, you know, look the way he liked to have it. This cup got buried somewhere in Korea after it had served its purpose. And 1,500 years later, it was dug up. But it was taken to a great museum. And the great critics and the connoisseurs looked at this little cup that some Korean farmer had made, who probably could neither read nor write. The one said, or the critic said to the other, it is perfection. Never could we improve upon this work of art. It has 
the most wonderful quality of all, and that is humility. It is simple. It was made only for a purpose, but in making it and in fulfilling its purpose, it's been fashioned a thing of exquisite beauty. This is fact. The simplicity of things is their beauty. And these principles that move inside of us are just destroyed by our own emotional overtones. After we've studied art long enough, we couldn't make that cup. It would be utterly impossible. That cup had to be made by the soul, not by the trained technician. And that is why folk art is the art of God in man. And is sometimes the greatest art of all. This simple thing is the Zen idea of acceptance. There is no problem unless we make a problem. Now the atomic bomb stands there and looks awful like a problem. It has the appearance of one. We read about it. It sounds like one. We wonder how anyone can say this is no problem. It isn't, actually. It will either explode or it will not explode. And about this, there is really no problem. There is the cons constant need for man's being able to adjust to accept and to move on from acceptance without fear. This acceptance means that if he survives, he will be of the greatest help in the restoring of his world. He does not survive. He will go forth into a better world, perhaps, than he has ever known. These problems are simple acceptance. It has been observed also that where an individual is very sick, that one of the most important things of, in the world is to get a certain acceptance, a certain conscious uh, understanding, a final acceptance of the fact. Thousands of persons who would otherwise have died have lived because they were able to achieve a state of acceptance. Rebellion would have killed them in a month in the precarious situation they were in. But acceptance released all of, na of nature's energies for reclamation purposes. And almost miraculous recoveries have been reported from such conditions. Because the individual simply got out of his own way. And because he did not and the pressure of his own fear, he recovered. In every walk of life, pressure destroys judgment, limits utility and efficiency, detracts from our peace of mind, destroys the days that we have. Whatever the days may be, long or short, let us use them and not abuse them. Let each day be as full of beauty and of truth and of understanding as possible. He would tell us that, among other things, we must not hate our enemy. And we know from a political standpoint that there probably is nothing more disastrous to the morale of the world today than this psychological warfare between the socialized states and the democratic powers. It isn't really what either side is doing is what it might do. It's the long-range fear, the doubts, the uncertainties, the grievances, ever remembered, which is setting these two great groups against each other in a struggle to the death. If both groups could accept, just relax. Mr. Khrushchev could stop pounding desks with his shoe and settle down to the very simple fact that he is perhaps a rather lovable, funny old man. He can look in the mirror and see himself deprived of his honors and estates. He might look like somebody's grandfather.
and he would be much better off if he played the part. Because these things do not mean anything. Khrushchev may be one of these days removed from office by the familiar method. <laughs> he may last a little while. If nothing else happens to him. Nature will ultimately remove him. And he will have a life of shouting and howling, screaming and groaning. But he could have had a very happy time of it and perhaps brought a lot of happiness to many other people. But all kinds of things that are not so move in. Great grievances that must be paid off. Great races of scientific power find out who can get to the moon first. The little question that we haven't gotten around to yet is with the Earth going to be here when they get back from the trip? <laughs> This doesn't seem to concern anyone. But this quiet process of acceptance simply lets down these tensions. Uh, in private life, it is such a, a, a very helpful thing, too. There are people who worry the moment their children leave the house, worry if they're not back within five minutes after school is out, worry if the husband is 15 minutes late getting home, Worrying about this, worrying about this, that, a life of worry. No wonder these people are hard to get along with and hard to uh, understand. These people are having trouble getting along with themselves because everything suddenly becomes tension. Everything becomes fear. There is no acceptance. How we can be a religious people and claim that we believe in a good God that protects us, and how we can affirm the spiritual power of prayer, how we can basically sense that this world is in the hands of an almighty providence, how we can have these feelings and then live from one uncertainty to another with a hundred doubts in a single day and a, a natural instinct to interpret everything as negatively as possible. How such inconsistencies can exist is hard to understand. It can only mean that our religion hasn't gotten in where it is really taking care of things for us. But by acceptance, we can take most of the power out of the bomb. We can certainly take out of it its power to destroy our lives without ever going off. Under the existing conditions, we will produce a generation of nervous wrecks in which two-thirds of our population will ultimately become psychotic and no bomb has been fired. In this situation, true, two were fired. But in the great problem of things, we are living in a tremendous anxiety. And this anxiety will cost us a hundred times the number of deaths caused by the fission of the largest bombs we could possibly create. Furthermore, this type of misery has a terrible chain reaction far more dangerous, more dangerous to us than the mutations that can result from the bomb. Because we are creating a situation in society today of neurosis, of fear, of panic, of loss of personal integration, of breakdown, ethical and moral, which at the least we can say will require ten generations of healthy living to remedy. And there is no prospect at the moment of the ten generations of healthy living. We are actually afflicting the next uh, three or four hundred years of our existence with the attitudes that we are permitting today. So for those who really want a spiritual consolation, a real spiritual help in this situation, Consider the problem of the significance of the factual. How every moment of the day can bring us 
great experience of beauty, a great enrichment of understanding. If we can just pause from the panic long enough to be quiet and to receive into ourselves something of the ever-present availability of good. If we can only get away from these exaggerations, we can achieve a great deal that is valuable and important. The next thing that naturally arises in connection with this concept is the reconciliation of our concept of God with the concept of the bomb. Somehow the bomb caused us to sort of feel that maybe we were too much even for God to handle. But somehow God couldn't prevent the bomb. That this power in man which is God was inadequate to prevent man's own abuse of this power. I think we have to we have to revise this thinking a little bit too. For thousands of years we believed in hell, very literal hell, with nice barbecues in it, <laughs> with our enemies and the members of other beliefs turning on spits. <laughs> and being basted by assorted demons. Actually, in the New England, that we were taught in the 17th century that not only this hell was there with all our relatives toasting, but those of the true faith who survived this ordeal and didn't land in hell were on a wonderful sort of promenade deck where they could look down on all this and sing... Psalms of happy glory while they watched their parents broil. <laughs> now, we believe this. It's just how stupid we can be. But we believed it in a good faith. We honestly thought this was true. It never occurred to us to wonder in what part of the nature of God hell was located. How a universe composed and created by God fashioned by the divine will and sustained by the divine wisdom. There's what part of it would be set aside for perdition. We never got around even figuring that out. It came finally to our realization that there was hell. That hell had to be in God. This became less and less attractive as a thought, and we gradually got over it. Now, where in this same picture is the atomic bomb? Is this atomic bomb, or perhaps a hundred other things that we will invent in the future, is this great problem that we are presently facing, one which actually involves a disillusionment in the nature of God? I don't think that we have any right to assume that such is the case. In the first place, we are dealing only with the most remote extremities of the divine plan. We are dealing only with matter. Actually, atomic fission has occurred by natural causes in space from the beginning. Worlds have exploded and gone to nothing. Universes have come into being. Creatures and creations lived and died. But the universal processes go on. I don't think that the atomic bomb represents a universal or divine emergency at all. It represents nothing more or less than a rare example of human stupidity. If this planet and all that it inhabits were to be blown into space, even modern science would be hesitant to suggest that anything had died or that anything had been destroyed. Things had been changed. Change as a mutation everywhere occurring in nature. It is very doubtful if we can assume that the atomic situation is any more 
uh, a danger uh, to the spiritual program of life than the most common accidents and occurrences. It is more spectacular, but probably in no sense essentially different. The atomic bomb cannot touch the great universal pattern, for it is only a fragment, a minute fragment, in one tiny part of that pattern. Now it is true that all kinds of consequences might come to man, but these consequences relate only to the external physical existence of things. I believe that we will ultimately demonstrate scientifically that we can destroy man's body with a bomb, but that we cannot destroy his soul. That the moment we escape from the peculiar boundary of matter, a boundary which forms walls, houses, doors, and prisons, but does not create any of the lives in these things that this bomb cannot touch any essential value that would not also be susceptible to worms and dry rot. It is more spectacular, but it is not essentially different. The body of man ultimately disintegrates. We have never held this to be a great, a great evil. The circumstances of this disintegration have no effect upon the essential fact, and here we have to be factual again. We, of course, a wholesale destruction of life by atomic means might work a considerable hardship upon the morticians, but it will not change the essential nature of man. The only thing that can happen to him is to have him blown out of a body. And this is not essentially different from the fact that he may be thrown out of it in any one of a hundred ways. His chances of being destroyed by a bomb, according to some modern statistics, are about, uh, we will say, one in a hundred in comparison to his chances of being killed on a freeway. The freeway is far more dangerous than the bomb. Also, whether we realize it or not, common aspirin is more dangerous than the bomb. Alcohol is a thousand times more dangerous than the bomb. Because at least a greater part of the victims of the bomb are more or less clear casualties. Some are not. Uh, but uh, those that are near the center of the bomb certainly are. But in alcohol, every individual is a continuing casualty. A terrible, gradual destruction. These things, however, have never worried us. It is because we are not factual. We have said this is death and this is death, but death is not death. If you die this way, it's a disaster. If you die that way, it's an achievement. Factually, we move from this condition into another. Whether we are moved by the bomb, or whether we are moved by the neglect of a common cold, is a very little essential difference. We do have a certain inability to plan our future. But in religion, we've abused that kind of planning too long anyway. We have abused the concept of retirement ever since we had it. We have abused the idea of procrastination, of putting things off until some other better day. It never came. But we, uh, we did have a certain belief in it. These changes will be of considerable use to us. That everything is shortened, intensified, and vitalized. And if we can face each day with a sense of the totality of that day, 
we can achieve tremendous uh, satisfaction and security and peace. The individual who knows how to live is always ready to die. For it is the end of our religion, whatever our faith may be, that it shall help us to live well and to die with a good hope of the future. Therefore, our religion has to give us the strength to die well. And what kind of people die well? Usually, the individual whose inner life has been matured and who has a deep and abiding faith in the universal values which underlie existence. Therefore, religion bestows upon us a peace in this transition, even as it sustains us during the years of our sojourn here. In this, the atom bomb brings again a message to us. It tells us that we should live always today, so that by character, by understanding, by insight, we are always ready to leave this world in dignity. That we are ready, whenever the call comes, to leave without regret, without fear, but only with a great hope of the future. This means that to leave here without regret, we've got to sort of put things here in order a little better than we have them. We can't leave things here without regret if all our hope, all our faith, all our confidence is locked into these things which we must leave. Buddha tells us very definitely uh, that the wise person, the truly factual person, delivers himself from the tragedy of his own possessions. Most people who are unable to die well have this terrible uh, confusion in the end because they are bound more to this world than they are to the principles of life and truth. Consequently, this simple fact problem that we have already mentioned has an application here that we must realize that we never own anything. We must realize that at any point in our career we can safely rest. That nothing that we are doing here is really very important as a thing. A man has a great project. He wishes to build a new city in California. Probably too many men in California have already had this idea. This towns are springing up like mushrooms. But this is to be his great life work. So in the midst of it, he develops strange symptoms and is told he only has six months to live. This is a tragedy. Because he has already plans for ten years. And perhaps, incidentally, ten million dollars. Here is a horrible disaster that has happened to him. The bottom is out of the universe as far as he is concerned. There is no justice anywhere. But what this man was never able to be was factual. He should have known from the beginning that every day was a day with certain hazards. Every day he rode out to his project. Any one of those rides could well have been his last. He wasn't factual. He didn't realize that the real problem was not that he finished the project. The problem was what did he learn working with the project. He might have labored for another ten years on that project and not been a bit better man than he was. 
the day he died. It is not that he would finish the project that nature was interested in. What nature was interested in is how much did he grow from working with the project? What did he learn about human hearts? How did he enrich his own character? How did he stand up against the temptation of corruption? Was he honorable? Was he true? Did he do a job well? Were his motives right? These are the things that nature was interested in. Nature was not at all concerned with whether his dreams came true or not. Nature's problem was, what was the dream? Was the dream itself true? For this was the thing that man took with him into an eternal existence. So by attaching ourselves too positively to the things, we sense the danger of loss. We huddle, we grasp the things we want to hold on to. We go into panic at the possibility of losing them. Forgetting entirely that we must all lose all of them. So Zen again sits down and says, we must lose them when we die. Why not lose them while we're alive? and therefore have peace in the last 25 years instead of a desperate struggle to hold on to something that must slip away. Why cling to these things when we cannot actually win? There is no being known in history that has ever won the fight to hold on to anything. Yet each day we try it because we're not factual. Factually, we have right usage. The things that make life better for us, the things that make experience richer, we can delight in, we can enjoy them. But they come and they go. With happiness, we receive them. With happiness, we must release them. If we do that, fear has no longer this hold upon us. Perhaps the atomic age will remind us even more acutely how little we can possess. And perhaps it may go so far as to overthrow this concept that status is possession. The only reason why possession is important is because men think it's important. And if they change their patterns, possession will no longer be a symbol of status and we will not care nearly so much about it. Perhaps it will take a bomb to remind us that we bring nothing but ourselves into this life, and we can take out of this life nothing but ourselves. Also, perhaps, the bomb will give us a new dimension of spiritual integrity about people. Actually, people are very wonderful creatures. They're troublesome at times, but they are still very wonderful people. They are very worth knowing, very worth understanding. And there are tremendous possibilities in human relationships that have never been touched under the strange psychology by which we live. We have set up a pattern by which it is almost impossible for an individual to be himself. We have surrounded him with innumerable artificial factors. We have decreed this and declared that. And we have bound this individual into a series of patterns and defenses which we are almost unable to break through. If we live in a moment in which now is our life. Perhaps we will suddenly wake up to the fact that it is no longer necessary or important to play games, to make all kinds of strange and foolish attitudes and try to nurse them. We will no longer be expected to put on appearances and to various ways deceive each other or exploit each other. In hours of great emergency, people 
truly become people. In those moments, all the little things are forgotten. All the pettiness seems to disappear. I've seen this in areas where some natural disaster struck. People who never spoke to each other were suddenly friends because of need. Something big opens up in the individual in an emergency. Well, we have an emergency, and we hope that something big will open up in all men. That suddenly they won't be any more shamming. There won't be any more make-believe. But that values will be straight. We won't be able to afford subterfuge. Because our period of possible association is too uncertain. So, leaving all the sham, the make-believe behind, we can meet as human beings. We can serve each other as human beings. We can give and accept as human beings. We will not have to worry and fuss and fume over the long-range strategies with which we hope to exploit or afflict each other. Now is the only time for that true friendship, for that true understanding, for that immediate meeting of hearts and minds in which we can have honest associations in life. The bomb may make dishonesty no longer very helpful or important. There's very little help, use in stealing from another man if you're going to die yourself with the goods in your hands a few hours later. It makes very little difference about these kind of things. But there are values that are so tremendous that we can live a lifetime in an hour. These values have to come into their own. And they always should have. Man had, a, had 60 or 70 years, 80 years perhaps, to learn how to live. Perhaps now he must gain this same experience by what might be termed an intensive course, somewhat shorter in duration. But he can still graduate with honors. He can still do all of the things that were ever important or that he ever could do. But he must do them now instead of putting off forever this day of attainment. Religion then suggests the motion of belief, perhaps, toward this idea of the one world faith. The one world faith in which we no longer have any time left for who is right and who is wrong. We have no longer any time for the careful consideration of the historical aspects of theology. If a man has only a few years to live, does he want to spend his time debating orthodoxy? He would probably laugh and say, no, he doesn't. If he does want to spend it that way, there's something definitely wrong with the man. If we have all the time in the world, we can waste it in arguing. But if we haven't so much time, there are much more important things that we can do if we must conserve resources. And when we start conserving our time resources, the first thing to do is to stop those things which only waste time. One of them is religious debate, which has never been won by anyone, because the simple facts are not available beyond a certain point, and everyone immediately goes beyond that point, into a very rarefied atmosphere where no one knows what he's talking about. And the fact that a hundred have come to the same conclusion about something none of them understood does not constitute scientific knowledge. So the, the process is comparatively worthless. Religion becomes, uh, to the individual then, an available instrument of orientation. 
Uh, religion becomes the only way in which a person can live happily in an uncertain state. Religion becomes the pacifier of the inner life of man, helping him to maintain his values so that they are never shaken by the tempest of outer things. Religion is then reduced to its essential. An essential we've never gotten around to really working with. And that is its immediate power to affect beneficially the life of the believer. Religion must work rapidly, like everything else, if time is short. There are three or four essential principles of religion which can be disseminated rapidly. They are the ones that we have always held to be the most important, but which we do not always emphasize. For example, if we had the Bible in front of us, and we did not know how long we were going to live, we might not wish to start with Genesis and end with Revelation. We might not quite get to Revelation. We might be caught in the midst of the first uh, Thessalonians or something of that nature and that would be the end of us. But what would we be most likely to do if we knew or had some plan we would choose those sections which would be most helpful and consoling and strengthening to us. And if we could only read a few pages of that book or a very small fragment I suspect that most Christian people would read the Sermon on the Mount. The rest of it would sort of get lost. We wouldn't have time to fool with it. It would be nice if we had forever. We could even read the begats, which might go on for hours and hours and hours. But certainly, if our lives were uncertain, we would not linger over the begats. In the same way in surveying our religious life, if our problems were real and intense, we wouldn't wander through this endless problem of bickering and differing, of arguing and fighting, of combating and refuting that has disfigured religion for thousands of years. We would go after the facts that we can use. And the facts that we can use are for the most part very simple, things that a child can understand. And having understood them, apply them. Now the difference between a religious or sacred book and an ordinary book is that a sacred book is said to represent, or is held to represent, an, an affirmation of spiritual fact, either revealed by God to man, or revealed by God through man, through the experience of ages. Therefore, there is a certain solemn assurance in these words, that they represent truths, unchanging, timeless, and that these truths constitute a pattern of conduct acceptable to God and space and nature. That is all religion of religion we need. These simple statements that represent our essential covenant with the spiritual source of life. So our religions will have to be simplified if we're going to live in a space atom age. I think someday we're going to have a new kind of Bible which I think might be very interesting. I think we might have a Bible that contains about ten short chapters. And each one of these chapters is composed of the noblest, the most sublime, and the most eternally true statement to be found in each of the religions of the world. We can put this in our pocket. It doesn't make any difference whether it's from the Vedas or the Koran. Is it true? Is it a statement made so peculiarly well, with such deep penetration of insight, that it strikes directly into our own heart and into our own need? 
and in probably 20 or 30 pages, the religion of man can be revealed to man. The rest is darkness. The rest is uncertainty. So religion in an age of constant pressure must be sublimated into its very essence. And that essence must be given to man. We worried very much about the problems, for instance, of teaching religion in public schools. We don't think we should take a people and indoctrinate them uh, with a religious concept, especially when we have a polyglot culture. This is all right. I don't say we should. I can see many reasons why it might be a good idea if we could, but perhaps the way things are, it is better not to. But if we once can get this concept of a one world faith, a one religion for one humanity, these 20 chapters that I'm mentioning, or dozen chapters, summarizing the wisdom of all men, could very well be a textbook, perhaps for reading, in the fourth or fifth grade, by means of which man would be actually educated from the very text of the greatest convictions of his race, and would grow up with these convictions in his heart. Perhaps then, we might get around to teaching man to read in school, in order that he might be able to understand some of these things. The moment we get past the creeds, to get down to the principles, we're not going to have these unhappy mothers and fathers storming the board of supervisors, or the board of uh, key parent teachers moving in on something every time a little morality is taught to one of our children. I was present when one mother jumped up at a meeting and said she did not want ethics to be taught to her child in school because she wanted her child to go out in the world and get rich. So this is the situation. Now how are you going to cope with it? But I do believe that if this mother suddenly realizes that the boy might not live long enough to go out in the world and get rich, perhaps she'd be a little bit more interested in him being a good boy now. But it is this long future. Mother will be gone long before the son, probably, would get to the zenith of his career. She is leaving him as a bit of unfinished business in the universe and going on her own way. She will not live to see, in all probabilities, the tragedy resulting for her own, from her own short-sightedness. But we don't need this type of situation. We can shorten all these things down, as most of them should be shortened. And we can gradually build into this situation the simple fact of our spiritual need, and this is our religion for the future. We can read our whole sacred book before breakfast, but it will take us as long as we can live to apply it. But things have got to be shortened down. They've got to be made available to the individual who does not have time. Not because he is too busy making money, but because he is too near to the unknown. All this long-range planning has become meaningless. Years ago, Henry Ford, before he died, said that the, a generation would arise after him in which the, the virtue of the long-range plan would disappear. For generations, everyone planned for the future. And in planning for the future, forgot to be anything now. Everyone was reaching beyond himself. He never paused to consider himself. He was out conquering the world. He never stopped long enough to look inside of himself and see what he was trying to conquer with. These problems were not important. 
but suddenly this vast panorama is foreshortened. Everything must be brought into immediate fulfillment. World peace must come now. It cannot any longer be pushed off to an unborn generation. Juvenile delinquency must be met now. It cannot longer be delayed. Crime, poverty, these things must be handled now, because now is the only time we have. And our religion must grow in us now. Our philosophy of life must develop in us now. The good things must be done now. This seems to me we haven't very much time to work with. But now let us take a life for a moment and see just exactly what now means. Supposing we say that without bombs, freeways, or phenobarbital, we would have a 30 or 40 year life expectancy. What would this really actually mean? What does it mean, what does this period of life expectancy mean in the actual achievement of things? How much will we have of real life and thought? With a life long career of that nature stretching out ahead, we really have a good opportunity to get well absorbed into something. Here we have the chance of rising in the business which used to be, in the old days, the big thought. Instead of higher pay, as we think now, the thing that was dangled in front of the young employee was that he would rise in the business. To rise in the business meant that if he were faithful and honest for 46 years, <laughs> he might rise to the degree of being head cashier. And when he retired, if he lived to retire, he would receive a glorious grandfather's clock with large chimes in it that would awake him on the hour and for the rest of his life. This was rising in the business. This was something that really was tremendous. In order to do this, you had to be faithful unto death. In fact, you had to be half dead to succeed at it. <laughs> This would take two-thirds of your waking time for the entire period. And as you got down through this situation and found out how much time your wages actually bought for you, and then considered what you tried to do with that time in order to be able to get back to work the next day, and these little outings which were desperate escapes, from the marvelous opportunity of rising in the business, and the responsibilities of family and other duties. I would suspect that a man with, say, 40 years perspective might actually have a year of actual time which he could use to understand himself, to grow, uh, to perfect or develop some instinct in his own consciousness. Perhaps all the time he ever had for that during the 40 years was the hour on Sunday morning when he went to church. Thus, this 40 years did not give him any particular uh, advantage. If he had been freed from some of these involvements, he might very well have adjusted internally, awakened internally, grown, unfolded in consciousness just about as much in six months or a year of real application as he could in this entire period of time. It has been proven in public schools that this idea that a child has to have 16 years of schooling before it can graduate is ridiculous. It doesn't have to. With proper methods of instruction, the average child can learn all that it is necessary for it to know in half the time. But we can't get around to making anything practical. In life, this shortening of time 
in no way essentially means that we are deprived of opportunity. It simply means we've got to recognize opportunity and do something with it. We can live 40 years before we recognize it, or we can recognize it immediately. We have a relativity factor here, which I think will play a very important part as we go on down through time. Evasions, avoidances, procrastinations don't mean much anymore. Also, we have no way to escape the psychological consequences of the intensifying of situations that have already existed. The atomic threat has simply pressed together all of the problems of humanity into one package and dumped it on our doorstep. They're not new problems, they're the same old ones. But they are not spread as they were. They are now brought into a compact mass, and they have to be faced as such. With this uh, basic concept, we, we have wonderful opportunity to make the adjustments. If we fail to make these adjustments, what is going to happen? We're going to break up now, before the bomb ever does it. We're going to suddenly realize in a comparatively short time that either we have to have religion or we can't make it. The entire processes of abnormal psychology have been speeded up. The neurotic, who might have drifted half sick through a long life, now breaks in three months because of pressure. This doesn't mean that he wasn't sick before. But he is now completely sick, quickly. Whereas otherwise he would be half sick for the rest of his life. He must therefore face this problem and find his remedy now. He also has many more inducements to find a remedy. Many people have gone along through life half sick for 50 years and never known it because they have never experienced a healthy day. They've considered their own peculiar uh, psychotic state as quite normal. Everyone else was crazy. But this condition will not prevail. The individual under psychic stress is breaking quickly, which is only telling us that he was never strong enough to stand the stress. Also, it is telling us what is wrong with civilization, what is wrong with education, what is wrong with culture. It is telling us, beyond any question of doubt, the weakness of the entire structure under which we live. And it's bringing this to us fast and hard. The only way we can solve the problem is to catch the ball now and quick. So this is how the entire spiritual problem sums up. That suddenly we are confronted with immediate needs for immediate action, that everything we believe will, will be tested quickly, it will be found sufficient or not sufficient. If it is not sufficient, we will know it now. And if we have common sense, we will do something about it now. But all the dilly-dallying, all the theological arguments, all the long struggle of the sects to justify their own religious opinion, all the traditions and the precedents and the policies are suddenly brought as to a final judgment. They are weighed in the balance. And all that we have believed, all that we have talked about, all we have read about, either helps now or it will never help. We have put off applications so we haven't realized fallacy. But out of this can come the greatest awakening that the world has ever known. It can transform us uh, from a people without direction, without intention, drifting along 
a path of least resistance into a dynamic group, suddenly recognizing the magnitude of its own need and the immediacy of its own problem. Out of these things can be fashioned the elements of a new religious conviction. And this is the kind of conviction we have to have if we are going to be well now. If we are going to be able to go to bed and sleep tonight. And if we are able to get up in the morning tomorrow and go and do the good things of the day without first frightening ourselves out of our wits. Also, we are going to free ourselves from those strange dreams that trouble the darkness. We are going to take no part in these squabbles and arguments that can never mean anything whether they are lost or won. We are going to be quiet. We are going to strengthen our inner conviction. We are going to clarify our own inner faith. We are going to find what help we need quickly, because we have to have it quickly. And we're going to devote our years and our times to the fulfillment of those things most meaningful to us in the largest terms. As we begin to live this way, you know it's quite possible that the bomb won't fall. Because one of the reasons why it is likely to fall is because we have lived stupidly. If we improve, we may also have the skill, the wisdom, and the insight to escape this hazard, because the bomb will only be used to frighten, or to destroy, or to intimidate, or to bewilder. And if man does not react to these, physical temptations to panic. There is very little to be gained. There is no way of breaking the spirit of man. There is no way of intimidating him. There is no way of enslaving him. If he lives with a clear internal vision of value. And out of this type of thinking, perhaps we can build a religion that would be pretty useful and which we have long needed. And now, perhaps, you'll have the incentive to perfect and apply. Well, time's up, so I guess we have to quit.